Welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about a topic we try to avoid, which is taxes. Here's the reality. Whether you're an investor or a business, what you get to spend, what you get to earn, is after-tax income and after-tax cash flows. So taxes are part of the valuation story. But unfortunately, they're among the most volatile and difficult to forecast pieces of the story. And here's why. Income gets taxed in different ways in different parts of the world. To make it worse, even in the same part of the world, the way income gets taxed can change over time. So the start of every year, I look at how taxes work around the world to get a sense, if I'm a business, of the kind of challenge I face when I look at how much I pay in taxes. So let's start with a very simple proposition. Do taxes affect the value of a business? Absolutely. In fact, if you use the traditional discounted cash flow technique of expected cash flows being discounted back at the discount rate, taxes play a role in both numbers. Let's start with the expected cash flows. The expected cash flows you discount are after-tax cash flows. Of course, you don't get taxed on cash flows, you get taxed on income, but the tax you pay on your income, the effective tax rate, and we'll come back and talk about the distinction between different types of tax rate across your income, can affect how much you get to keep as cash flows. So holding all its constant, the less you pay in effective taxes, the more cash flow you have. Now, taxes also affect your discount rate, at least at the corporate level, and here's why. If you're a business and you use equity to fund some of the business and debt to fund some of the business, in much of the world, the tax code is tilted towards debt. What does that mean? Interest expenses on debt are usually tax deductible, but cash flows to equity are not. So you get a tax benefit from debt, and because you get a tax benefit, the cost of debt can actually be lower than it looks. So if you borrow money at 8%, and I'll let you, uh, to cl let you claim a 25% tax benefit in your interest expenses, effectively you're borrowing money at 6%. So here, the higher your tax rate, holding all else constant, the lower your discount rate is going to be. So already you can see cash flows are affected and discount rates are affected, and that changing the tax rate and evaluation can have different consequences for different companies. So that said, let's look at some very specific measures of tax rates. There are three different versions of tax rates you might run into, and you might as well get used to them because they play different roles in valuation. The first is a marginal tax rate. What is a marginal tax rate? It's a tax rate you have to pay on your last dollar of income, the last hundred dollars of income. You're likely to find this not in the financials of the company, but in the tax code. And obviously, it'll vary depending on which country's tax code you look at. The marginal tax rate is the tax rate you use when you compute the tax benefits from debt. And here's why. Interest expenses on debt save you taxes on at the margin. Sounds mysterious, but let me explain. If you have $1,000 in income and you have $200 in interest expenses, I allow you to offset your income with the interest expense and report a taxable income of $800. In effect, you save taxes not in the first $200 of income, not the middle, but the very last $200. So to compute your after-tax cost of debt, the tax rate you should be using is a marginal tax rate. Now, when you think about computing your tax taxes on your cash flows, now you're talking about taxes across your entire income. And here are two, two different versions of tax rates can come into play. The first is what's called an effective tax rate. Now, I'm sure some accountant is going to take issue with the way I define it, but the way I think about effective taxes tax rates is I go into the income statement of a company and I look at the taxes paid and I divide by the taxable income. Now, not the operating income, but the taxable income. I come up with the tax rate. That is the effective tax rate. Since it's coming from the income statement, it's an accrual tax rate. It's not the taxes you actually pay in cash, but it's an accrual tax rate. That's okay, though, because when you do valuation, use that accrual tax rate to compute the tax rate on your income. You come up with an after-tax operating income. And in fact, if your cash taxes vary from your accrual taxes, it shows up as taxes payable, or you know, it shows up in your working capital effectively and takes care of it when you do your cash flows. There's a third version of taxes that I sometimes see people trying to use, which is a cash tax rate. How do you get that? You take the cash taxes paid, this is the actual taxes you send to the government and divide by your taxable income. This generally should not be used in valuation, at least the way we compute cash flows, because you risk double counting. If you want to eliminate the taxes payable item from your, from your working capital, you could get away using this cash tax rate. But why, why mess with it? Just use an accrual tax rate and take care of the difference between accrual taxes and cash taxes when you do your cash flows. That's enough of a, of a preview. Let's start looking at some numbers. Let's first start looking at marginal tax rates and how they vary across countries.
among the highest marginal tax rates, in fact, the highest marginal tax rate at the start of 2017 was in the U.S. The marginal tax rate in the U.S. is about 40%. How do we get there? You have a 35% federal corporate tax rate, and then you have state and local taxes pushing you up to 40%. The average marginal tax rate around the world is between 26 and 28%. You can see the variations around the world. Not all com companies in these countries pay the marginal tax rate, but this is going to be a very important part of how much you borrow, because remember, the tax benefits of debt come from the marginal tax rate. Holding all its constant, if you operate in a country or you borrow in a country with a high marginal tax rate, you get a much higher tax benefit than if you borrow in a country with a low marginal tax rate. There are some countries, especially in the Middle East, where the marginal tax rate is close to zero. So you can see that marginal tax rates vary across countries, and it's something that we have to be aware of, even if we're not working with companies in those countries. Because if you have a multinational that generates income from any of the other parts of the world where marginal tax rates are different, the first cut on taxes is at that country's marginal tax rate. So that's the first stop, marginal tax rates. Now let's look at effective tax rates. And I'm going to start with the U.S. where the marginal tax rate was 40%, the highest marginal tax rate in the world. If you look at the effective tax rates paid by U.S. companies during the, the trailing 12 months leading into 2017, almost 88% of U.S. companies pay effective tax rates that are less than the marginal tax rate. Very few U.S. companies pay the 40%. Some actually pay more. You say, how can that be? Well, sometimes you have taxes deferred from previous years catching up with you. But most U.S. companies pay well below the marginal tax rate. Before you go all conspiratorial on me and try to think of some strange reason why this might be true, I'll give you the biggest reason for the difference. If you're a U.S. company that generates much of your income from outside the U.S., here's how the tax code works. You first have to stop and pay the tax rate in that country, which is much lower than the U.S. Okay, that's the first stop. The U.S. tax code, though, is a perverse one. It's one of the few countries in the world which taxes U.S. companies as if all their income are in the U.S. However, there's a catch. You don't get taxed on that income coming back to the U.S. until you bring it back. So here's what you have if you're a multinational. Let's say you generate a billion dollars in income outside the U.S., and you pay a 25% tax rate. The minute you bring that billion dollars back to the U.S., you have to pay the extra 15% if you bring it back to the U.S. Hence, you see the birth of trap cash. At, at, m there are estimates that U.S. companies have collectively trap cash of more than $2 trillion. I believe it because Apple alone has trap cash of 150 to $200 billion. This is cash that is trapped outside the U.S. because if it does come back to the U.S., you have to pay the differential tax rate. Bad tax laws have bad consequences, and this is one of those. So when you think about valuing a U.S. company, here's what you will tend to see. You'll see that the effective tax rate you use to get your cash flows can be well below 40%, and for the cost of debt, you get a 40% tax rate. That's why the U.S. tax code is so perverse. The U.S. tax authorities collect about the same amount in taxes as Europeans do, but because the marginal tax rate is so, so much higher, U.S. companies benefit more from borrowing money. Now, looking at effective tax rates around the world, you do get some differences. So this is a measure of both what the tax rate is in each country and how good each country is in collecting those taxes. So you can see effective tax rates, and there are parts of the world where the effective tax rate is greater than 30%. The Japan, in Japan, for instance, you have an effective tax rate which is over 30%. If you, if, you, if you again stop and say, well, that shows you that U.S. companies don't pay their fair share in taxes, it is true U.S. companies collectively pay about 28 percent, 26 to 28 percent effective taxes, depending on how you define it, well below the 40 percent. But if you compare the U.S. to the rest of the world, that actually puts them higher than much of the world. In fact, there are only a few parts of the world, Japan, maybe India, where the tax rate paid by companies is slightly higher than in the U.S., so the U.S. companies are paying their fair share in taxes if you define fair share as what companies around the rest of the world do. If, however, your definition of fair is paying 40 percent, well, you're right. U.S. companies could pay more and they're not.
So that's a debate that I think we're seeing playing out in politics and economics, but it's going to be a factor in how the tax code gets rewritten. But enough about that. We'll come back to that later. If you break down effective tax rate by industry group in the U.S. to see who's paying the highest tax rates and which which sectors, which industries are paying the highest tax rates and which ones are paying the lowest tax rates, here's what you find. You find that a lot of energy companies, whether it's coal or oil, end up with really low effective tax rates. I won't play tax authority here, but I'm sure there are clauses in the tax code that, that explain this because this is something you see systematically year after year. In fact, you see a lot of natural resource companies, paper and forest products, some real estate companies, hotel and gaming kind of show up in there. But it, you can see that the average effective tax rates paid by companies in the sector, and I'm looking only at money-making companies in the sector because it's really not fair to compute an average effective tax rate across an entire sector if three-quarters of the companies are not making money. So this is actually a tax rate among money makers, and these are the industries which have the lowest effective tax rate. I've also computed what I call an aggregate effective tax rate. What I do there is I take the total taxes paid by the sector and divide by total taxable income. So think of this as a weighted average tax rate across the entire sector. And on that dimension as well, you can see that these sectors often have very low tax rates. Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum. The kinds of businesses that pay the highest taxes, and these are 35, 36, 37, 38 percent, are on this list. You'll notice that some of them are, are, in a sense, domestic companies because they get so much of their revenues in the U.S., they don't get the degrees of freedom that a company that generates revenues outside the U.S. does. And you can see that in these sectors, companies pay 30, you know, much more than what you saw as the effective tax rate for the U.S. as a whole. Now, let's bring this all together because the 2017 is shaping up as a year where at least the U.S. tax code is going to get rewritten. We don't know what form that rewrite will take, but it seems like a pretty good bet that by the end of this year, the way U.S. companies get taxed can be different. Now, we can sit here and think about a continuum. At one end of the continuum, you can think of, a, of, of tweaks to the existing tax system. So there are some who are talking about changing, not changing the tax code fundamentally, but bringing down the marginal tax rate in the U.S., that 40 percent that's among the highest in the world, down to a level that is more competitive, competitive in the sense that it's more comparable to what other countries are charging, maybe 26, 28. The number actually is in debate, but actually when you, when you see the different proposals, the lower the corporate tax rate gets, in return, some of the deductions will be taken away, whether it's the, the deductions that are allowed to the energy sector, whether it's the R&D tax credit. But the marginal tax rate will, will come down. Will this have an effect on value? Obviously. It will have an effect on value by reducing effective tax rates for those companies that can now benefit from, the, from a lower marginal tax rate. And remember, if you looked at the list, the previous list, the industries which are paying 35, 36, 37 percent are the ones that are going to be most benefited by the lowering of the marginal tax rate. But if you're only paying 10, 12, 13 percent, the effect of lowering the marginal tax rate might not be positive. In fact, it can end up being negative if I take away some of the tax credits or deductions you have. The companies that are most likely to win if this is the change that's coming are companies with, which are paying high effective tax rates today and use very little debt. You're saying, why is debt even coming to the picture? picture? Remember that the benefits of tax benefits of debt are a function of the marginal tax rate. So if you're a company that has a very high debt ratio, when I lower the marginal tax rate, your cost of capital went up. So in, in fact, that might be offsetting some of the benefits of having higher cash flows. So the winners of the companies that have high effective tax, ra tax rates and low debt, the losers will be companies that are paying low effective tax rates now and potentially using some of the deductions that are going to be taken away and have high debt ratios. So winners and losers from that type of change. There is a more radical change that's being talked about, something that we've never seen in the U.S. corporate tax code before, which it's, it's, a, it's a mouthful. It's called a destination-based destination cash flow system, but it's really a value-added tax. What it will effectively do is replace the tax on income with the tax on goods and services, and it will have consequences because the way the tax, at least the, the changes that are being talked about, are going to work out is the tax rate you pay will vary if you're as a company depending on three things. The first is 
where you get your inputs. Are you getting them primarily from the U.S.? Are you getting them from outside the U.S.? Second, whether wages that you pay employees are a big part of your cost of goods sold or a small part. And the third is where you sell your output. In fact, let me show you a picture that kind of at least gives, based on my understanding of the DBCT, which is not that good, you know, kind of tries to capture the effect it will have on your taxes. If you, if, so let's start with the inputs that you use to produce your goods and services. If they're primarily or mostly from outside the U.S., you will actually be affected negatively by the change in the tax code because you will have to pay tax on those inputs. If they're mostly or all from the U.S., you'll be affected less. If wages are a very small percentage of your cost of goods sold, you'll be affected more negatively by this new DBCT than if wages are a high percent because they're talking about wages being a deductible expense, an expense you'd be able to deduct before you pay your value-added tax. If your revenues are primarily or only in the U.S., you will be affected more negatively than if they're more outside the U.S., so let's think about the companies that are going to see their taxes go down the most if this tax proposal comes into play. In my view, these will be companies that are get almost all their goods and services made in the U.S., have, a, have wages being a high percentage of those costs of goods of the cost of goods sold, and sell these goods and services outside. So basically, these are companies that produce in the U.S. using labor as their primary input and sell their goods and services outside the U.S. Those will be the companies that will see the biggest benefits. Some might actually see the tax rates go to zero, or even get a tax credit from the government if they tailor it right. At the other end of the spectrum, here are the companies that are going to be hurt the most. If you import most of the goods and services that you, the inputs that you need to produce your goods and services, if wages are a very small percentage of your costs and you sell your goods and services in the U.S., you could see a substantial increase in your taxes. Now, we know that there's many a slip between the cup and the lip, that what you see described as the initial tax reform almost never is the final form. So we're going to see this tax reform play out. It's like watching sausage being made. It's never pretty. And I know that, that the tax right, the, I, I've, I have sympathy for those people who are going to be working on this because they're going to be hit from every side with advice. So I'm going to add my advice to the mix. And it's not from the perspective of a tax expert, which I'm not. My suggestion to the tax writers is as they write this tax law, and I know this is almost an impossible task, keep it simple. I'd love to see a tax reform bill be 50 pages rather than 1,000 pages. Keep it simple. Less is more. No. Second, to the extent that you're using your tax code to modify behavior, please stop. Because tax codes are not very effective behavior modifiers. What am I talking about? Across the world, governments tried to tweak the tax code to encourage what they view as good behavior. More investment domestically, more employment, you know, good social, you know, uh, being a good social citizen. Those are, those are all, you know, worthy objectives, but the tax code is not the most effective way of modifying behavior. In my, from my perspective, you know, for every, uh, no good deed goes unpunished in the tax code. If you try to do something good in the tax code, the law of in unintended consequences almost always seems to take it to someplace bad. And finally, if you can, try to make the tax code predictable. The world, I mean, as a, as a business, you already face all kinds of uncertainty. Why add to that the uncertainty about the tax code? In fact, one of the most troubling aspects of the last round of tax reform we had was it came with a sunset clause. The tax reform was passed in 2003 and the whole thing disappeared in 2012. Talk about creating future uncertainty. So the less you revisit this law, the more, the, I think the more companies can build it into their behavior. And to me, here's the essence of good tax code. Tax code, if it is good, will never drive business behavior. You shouldn't be making investments simply because of the tax code. You simply shouldn't be you know, f deciding how you fund a business because of the tax code. You shouldn't be deciding whether to pay dividends or holding cash based on the tax code. Unfortunately, the tax code kind of intrudes into business behavior, and that to me is not healthy. So I hope as a result of this tax code, I'll be talking less about taxes in the future rather than more. Thank you very much for listening.